Uh, so we're going to pick it up in this fifth part. Go down to verse 19. If you don't have a Bible, share with the person next to you. or We're going to put it up on the screens as well. If you're there, can you shout amen? amen? Beginning in verse 19, the word of the Lord says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. As you see the day drawing near. We've been talking about Jesus. This book of Hebrews is all about Jesus. We talked about him as a better deliverer, a better priest, a better sacrifice. Today, I want to talk to you from this title. You're taking notes. I hope you are. We're going to learn from this conversation what the book is teaching us. Today, I've titled this message, Jesus, the better kingdom. Jesus, the better kingdom. We're going to pray. We're going to talk about chapters 10 through 12 in about 25 minutes. And then we're going to worship Jesus one more time and then go outside and have an awesome time. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for all that you have done, are doing, and will do. Thank you for this household of faith. Thank you for Calvary Church. Thank you for everyone here and connected online as well. Thank you for loving people like us, God. We, we can't earn it or deserve it, but you've been good and kind to us. Thank you for this book. Help us to see Jesus better today, God. We love you. And we thank you, and it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, and all of Calvary says, Amen. oh, come on, all of Calvary says, Amen. can you make some noise for Jesus one more time? Come on. On November 1st of 1755, one of Europe's most devastating earthquakes stung Lisbon, Portugal. This was a massive earthquake that rocked the city, that destroyed absolutely everything. They say that it claimed the lives of approximately 60 to 100,000 souls. It was a devastating earthquake. Some believe anywhere between 7.5 to 8.5 on the Richter scale or higher. It was completely devastating and horrific what this earthquake left behind. This actual earthquake, it actually brought some disturbance to the social and political world because at the time, Lisbon represented Northern Europe. And Northern Europe had began to declare itself as a political and economical power. And they believed that they were stabilized. In fact, there was this philosophical idea that was around at the time that they believed that the created order of the world was stable and good and that God looked after the well-being of human beings. This earthquake brought up a whole lot of questions and made people realize maybe we're not as stable as we think we are. It brought 75%, three-fourths of the city were absolutely demolished. This is what happens as we saw this past week when a hurricane came up our west coast and has left people without homes, without possessions. It makes us realize perhaps we're not as stable as we think we are. This earthquake actually was named the first natural disaster of our modern time because it changed the way we think. I think that all of us need to realize that we're living in an unstable world. Natural disasters have a way of reminding us and upsetting us of the permanence that we find in this world. They have a way from tornadoes to hurricanes, uh, all kind of flooding, all kind of disease and loss. They, they have a way of reminding us that in a moment, everything can be shaking and everything can be lost. 
I mean, it just takes a moment for a virus to go around the world and 6.5 million lives are lost. Everything can be shaken. And yet we tie ourselves to the earth and we try to build great kingdoms and we try to build great names for ourselves and we try to build these empires here on this planet as if it can bring any stability into our lives and into our soul. The problem is if we go to planet earth for our source, we're going to end up with a weakened faith with hope that is lost and with joy that is going to be shaken. In fact, I put it this way today. Today, if you have the wrong sources, it will lead to weak security. You, you want to be secure in this world? You, you want to have a faith that you can rely on? You need to go to the right source. You need to go to Jesus. And maybe like the Hebrew Christians that this letter is written to, some of us need to realize we don't go to a person, place, or thing. On this planet, on this rock, there is one that is higher. His name is Jesus, and we need to look to him. And yet so many of us today, I mean, all we got to do is look around the world and see people trying to build all kinds of empires, names for themselves. We're building castles that are really sandcastles crashed at every wave because perhaps we're living in a world that can be shaken. Our world will be shaken. And when it does, if our security is on that, hope, peace, joy, it goes with it. A relationship that we we thought was going to be the one that we were going to be in forever. It brought the peace and the love and the security. I found all that can go in a moment. Maybe it's it's our well-being. Maybe it's our health. In a moment, you can lose your health. All it takes is one doctor's call and it gives you the most upsetting news you can ever imagine. All it takes is for a family member to call you and say such and such a thing happened. And our world is shaken and rocked. And some of us in here today, this is where we're at. We have lost things. We have lost family. We have lost jobs. We've lost salaries. And it has left us, it, it left us bankrupt spiritually. Because we thought this is where we found stability. And maybe you're like that here today. Can I tell you, look to a different kingdom. Look to a different empire. Look to a different security. His name is Jesus. Everything else will be shaken. Everything else will crumble. Everything else can and will be lost. But there's one that remains. He sits on the throne forever and ever and ever. His name is King Jesus. And so today I put it this way, the right foundation leads to a reliable faith. You want a faith that can hold you in the midst of uncertainty, you need the right foundation and his name is Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, today, if you've looked other places, look to Jesus, only he can bring you hope. Okay, this is what the letter of Hebrews is talking about. Jesus is better is the message of the entire book of Hebrews. Right, we started this letter by saying, Jesus, he's better than angels. He's better than prophets. He's writing to Hebrew Christians living in Italy who have left Judaism, meaning they've left the synagogues, they've left sacrifices, they've left priests, and they are running after Jesus, but they are experiencing political stress. They they are experiencing persecution, peer pressure to leave Jesus and go back to an old thing. How it relates to us, maybe we didn't leave Judaism, but we left some things that we thought were stable. We're following Jesus, and when times get hard, we are tempted to go back to that thing that brought some stability in our lives. And some of, you, some of us today, we, we are looking back, and our theme this whole year is don't look back, move forward in Jesus' name. And it's what the, the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us, look forward to Jesus. Today, where do you have your eyes? Can I tell you the only place to put them is Jesus. Only Jesus will keep you stable. And so he's saying, hey, hey, Jesus is the better priest. Jesus is the better deliverer. Jesus is actually the better anchor. Jesus is the better sacrifice is what we talked about last week. He's better than Moses. He's better than Abraham. He's better than angels and prophets. Jesus is better. So we can talk about every week. Now, now some of us in here, we're like, okay, this has been sounding repetitive. Like, can we move on to another part? Or is this all he's going to say? They told an old preacher one time, hey, we've been coming for weeks and you keep preaching the same message. And he said, yeah, God told me to keep saying it until you get it. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) 
Like that's what the author is trying to do. He's going to keep repeating the message until some of us get it that Jesus is better. What are you going back to? Where are you running to? Run to Jesus. He's better than everything that this world can offer. And so today, if you came in expecting another message, there's only one in this church, that's Jesus. He's better than everything. He's better than this world. He's better than any kingdom. He's better than any empire. It's all about Jesus. And so, so he's talked about the priest for the past two weeks. We talked about Jesus, the better priest. He is the priest that represents us now, the eternal priest. And he doesn't just offer a sacrifice of a sheep, a lamb, a goat, or an ox. He is the sacrifice himself. So Jesus is the better priest and Jesus is the better sacrifice. This is how he's going to close off the section and begin in chapter 11. So, so chapter 10, look what he does. Chapter 10, as we just read, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, somebody say confidence, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Okay, he's repeating it one more time. We have now Access to the presence of God because of Jesus. As, as we close out this section of the priest, starting this fifth section of the book of Hebrews, I think one of the application points that we can take from this, if you're taking notes, number one, he's telling us, hey, draw near. Somebody say, hey, draw near. Draw near. He's saying, draw near. We've been given access by Jesus. Now, you got to remember, who is he writing to? He's writing to Hebrew Christians that have left synagogues, priests, and sacrifices to follow Jesus. So what is their mentality? That in order to get close to God, you need to come to a priest. You better come with a sheep, an ox, or a goat because you and I cannot get into the presence of God. And the priest would go for us. They couldn't get into the presence of God. So this is shocking language. He says, hey, today you can come in with confidence. Wow, this changes everything. One commentator says that for 10 chapters, he's been trying to persuade us and convince us that we're invited to the party. Oh, I love that. We're invited to the party and we got a VIP pass. And literally what was like this over the last few centuries of approaching God, trying to get a priest to represent us because we can't go to the holies of holies. We can't go to the room where the presence of God is. Now it says, come like this. Thank you, Father. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the blood. You and I are invited to the party. Warren Wearsby, he writes this way about Hebrews chapter 10 as the priest. In the old covenant, high priests visited the holies of holy once a year, but were invited to dwell in the presence of God in every moment. In other words, why we come in here on a Sunday morning and we lift up our heads and we lift up our hands and we begin to praise is because Jesus now is the curtain that has been ripped open so that you and I can meet with God every day, every moment, every minute, and every second. I don't have to go to a priest, a synagogue, or bring a sacrifice. There's a better sacrifice. Jesus has given his life so that as soon as I begin to mention his name, there's power in his name. I got access, I got a priest, and I can enjoy Enjoy the presence of God right here where I'm at. Oh, come on. That's good news. That's good news. I don't need to stay out of the veil. I'm invited to the party. This is good news for everybody because the book of Acts says the gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. Because of Jesus, you and I can come in here on a Sunday morning with hands up saying, Father, I'm here. I'm part of your family. I'm part of the family. I'm part of the party. Come on, that's good news. He says we have an advocate and we have access. There's a lot to digest there. You need to go home and study. This is amazing. I got a VIP pass. Somebody, better, If somebody comes to tell you, bro, what are you doing here in church? I saw you in the club last night. Number one, how do they know? Number two, <laughs> number two, I got forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. I got access to the Father. I'm here with my hands lifted and my hands raised because God has been good to me. And he says three things. Go to verse 22 through 25, Hebrews chapter 10. Because we have this confidence, then let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. In the Greek, it's literally from a guilty conscience 
or from a works conscience. We don't go before God because we have good behavior. We go before God confidently because of the behavior of Jesus, the works of Jesus, and the completed work of Christ. And our bodies washed with pure water, baptism, let us hold fast our confession of hope without wavering. For he who promises faithful, and number three, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? The day that Jesus is coming back. He's reminding them there's a better kingdom and it's coming. It's the kingdom of Jesus. So he says, let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider and stir up one another. This is why we say it, you can't be a Christian and be doing this thing on your own. This is why we have connect groups. It takes people that you're connected to that, that literally say, hey, hey, what is God doing in your life? In the Greek, is literally pushing somebody. That, that literally says in the Greek, you need somebody to push you sometimes. That you get in here on a Sunday morning, you're feeling like, man, oh God, I'm not going to raise my hand. I don't care who's here leading worship today. I ain't going to worship. I ain't going to do it. You need somebody to say, come on, God is for you. Lift your hands. God goes before you, behind you, surrounds you. He's got good plans for your life. He's a good God. Come on, push the person next to you. Tell them he loves you. He's for you. Come on, we need to consider how to do this together. I don't know about you, but I've needed some times on a Sunday morning to come in here and get around some people to say, come on, God is able. He's able to heal. He's able to deliver. He's able to save. I don't know about you, but I need reminders sometimes. And he says, draw near, hold fast, and consider one another. And don't stop meeting together. It's important when we meet together. It stirs up our faith when we get here on a Sunday. I don't feel like coming every Sunday, but when I do, I'm glad I did. It's good for my soul. And so he's saying, do this. And now he's going to go and say, there are some that have stopped meeting together. Oh, some of you stopped going to church because you have to sit in additional seating or somebody took your favorite chair. The whole team didn't give you the good parking spot. <laughs> People checking in your kids, they, they were mean and ugly. And I, we, we come up with all kinds of reasons to miss church. You ever notice? We, we don't. A waiter doesn't stop us from going to restaurants, but one bad person at a church stops us from going to churches. Like, I'm not going to let one person stop my experience of meeting God with my brothers and my sisters. I don't like, ah, the person that held the door, it held it like halfway. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> it's like, come on. He said, actually, in, in chapter 10, you got to read this when you get home. We don't have that much time. But in chapter 10, he says, some of you that you stop meeting together, some of you know people that have stopped coming, you know what happens to them? And he's going to go into apostasy. And he says, literally, some of them have apostatized. Verse 26 through 27, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Chapter 10 is deep. As he's finishing it off, he's, he's going to give the fourth warning. And he's going to say, don't deny Jesus. The fourth warning of the book of Hebrews is don't deny Jesus. And it's easier to deny him if you stop meeting together. And literally what he's talking about in the Greek is apostasy. What does apostasy mean? It's a literary term that when a whole unit went to war, in the middle of the battle, you turn to your brother, take out your weapon, and start shooting your own team. And he's saying there's some that we know that have stopped meeting together, and sooner or later, they start criticizing their own brothers and sisters, and they even start going against Christ. And they commit apostasy. And those that commit apostasy, oh, they can no longer be saved is what he's saying. It, this is deep. This is extremely profound. And some of us know people that that has happened to them. They at one point profess that Jesus is Lord, but because of X or Y reason of cultural pressure, peer pressure, all of a sudden, well, maybe Jesus isn't the only way. Now you can come to God through many different forms. 
Oh, you can go to the Father through a tree, through a cloud. You can meditate and find nirvana right there where you're at. You're the way to God as well. That's false. There's only one way. His name is Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth and the life. Don't you go back on your confession that Jesus is Lord. Whether the culture likes it or not, Jesus is the only way. He's the hope of humanity. He's the only Savior. He died and resurrected so that we can be saved. And you and I can't do that on our own. And so he's saying, don't commit apostasy. Now it's scary when you read that, but I love the next verse, verse 39, where he says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back. Oh, thank God. That's not you or I, he says. You and I, we're confessing Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't be like some of those friends that we've had that they leave the faith. We actually don't belong to those who shrink back. We draw near. Remember, we draw near to Jesus. Every day I wake up, I practice the presence of God in my car, in my kitchen, in my office, in my room. I practice the presence. I draw near before the Father, and he meets me where I'm at. You understand? You can meet God outside of these four walls. It's what we've been trying to teach our church over the last five years. Like, hey, you can meet God anywhere you go. Just open up your mouth and start praying. And by the name of Jesus, you are in the presence of God and he's right there with you. So we don't belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we belong to those who have faith. So he's closing off the priest section that we covered over the last two weeks and he's opening up the faith section. This is powerful. We don't belong to those who shrink back. We belong to those who have faith and are saved. Number one, we draw near. Number two, we take action. Somebody say, take action. And he goes into chapter 11 and he's going to begin to talk about faith. Somebody shout faith. This is a beautiful section in the book of Hebrews. One of the most well-known sections in the book of Hebrews is Hebrews chapter 11 because he begins to describe what faith is. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. He's saying faith is not a feeling. Faith is not optimism. Faith is not wishful thinking. He's saying faith, it is it is the assurance. Another word in the Greek is, it's the substance. We can stand on this thing. It's not a feeling, mm, I hope tomorrow's good. No, it's I know tomorrow's gonna be good because I have a good God. And whether I'm here or not, it's gonna be good. If I'm here, it's gonna be good. If I'm not here, it's because I'm with him. And that's good. It is good either way. I have faith in God. George Guthrie, he put it this way. Faith is what looks at the created order and has a firm and resolute confidence in the God whom it bears witness to. Who though in seen has provided a foundation for such a confidence through his mighty act. You and I can look at the created order of the world. We can look outside today and say, if God made that, he's got me. That's literally what it means. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and it's the conviction of of things not seen. We need to get this in our soul today. I'm going to say it one more time. Now, faith is the assurance of what is hoped for. He's speaking of future. And it's the conviction of things not seen. What he's saying is people of faith are people who see the future as though it were present. And people who see the invisible as if it were seen. This is powerful. You need to understand this. He's saying we have the assurance and conviction about the future as if it were now. And we have the faith and assurance of the invisible kingdom of God as if it were right here and I can see it. Do you have that type of faith? That, that we know, oh, tomorrow's going to be okay. I see the future. What he's talking about is resurrection, glorification, and the final kingdom of God. I know I may lose some things on this side. I know the earth below me may shake. I know a hurricane may come and I may lose possessions, family, and friends, but but I have a better hope in Jesus. And lose what I may lose, come what may, hell or high water, he's got me. And on the other side, we are all going to be resurrected, glorified, unified with him. That's faith. That's faith. And when you have that type of faith, can't nothing shake you. You got faith on the inside. 
and it seemed the invisible as if it were seen. And I got God with me. I got God with me. One commentator, Kent Hughes, he says this, I've never seen an angel with a flaming sword, but through the eyes of faith, I see them every day. Oh, that's powerful. This is why Christians, we, we shouldn't let anxiety take the best of us. It may come, but it won't break me. I may get nervous for a night, but it won't destroy me because I see the angels of God all around me. He goes before me, behind me, and he surrounds me. I see legions of angels. Oh, come on, he's with us. He's promised that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's with me in the night. He's with me in the morning. I'm not by myself. I got angels with me. I got God with me. I face tomorrow with God. I face tomorrow with him on my side. I will not pray. I may fall, but I get up by faith. Come on. Tell your neighbors, by faith. Oh, come on. I'm not saying that we won't be shaken. I'll be shaken, but I won't break. Our world today is hopeless because there's no people of faith. Our world today is lost because our culture does not have faith. Real faith. They have faith on empires on this side, but not on the real kingdom. Today, people are living for this world. Let's see how many social media followers I can get. Let's see how many people like my selfie. Let's see how many, if I can get verified, I need that blue check ASAP. Oh, come on, I need to build a big TikTok kingdom. I need to be followed. How can we make money? You know what we need today? We need men of faith. Oh, we need men who stand up to say, I won't live for this world. I'm not gonna live for the here and now. I'm not going to live addicted to social media. I'm not going to live addicted to the dollar. I'm not going to live addicted to what this world wants to control me by. Oh, we're going to be men who are faithful to wives, men who are faithful to family, men who raise good children, men who live for a better kingdom, men who are not addicted to lust, pornography, men who can lead, men who say the culture will not shake me or break me. I live for a better kingdom. I live for a better kingdom. I live by faith. I live by faith. You may I like it, but I live by faith. It won't be popular, but I live by faith. I'm not going to let the world tell me what marriage is and marriage is not. I'm not going to let the world tell me how many genders there are. I'm not going to let the world dictate how I live. I live by the word of God by faith. Because you can live however you want. Do it. You can do it. You can do it. But at the end of the day, it will be shaken. It'll be destroyed. Do it. It will break. Let, let some years pass. Let 50 years pass, 100 years pass. We'll see where we're at. Get, keep living for your kingdom. Keep living for your senses and pleasures. It'll end up shaking. It'll end up, but the people of faith say, I don't live for this. I live for the then and there as if it were here and now. That's my faith. That's by faith. And so we need men and women of faith. Women who don't let the culture tell them, sell your body. And let the world control you by how good you look or how good you can look on a social media platform. You, you live by faith in God's word. You live by faith. And time doesn't let us to keep, continue to keep going into the deepness of beautiful verse one. But he begins to list 16 heroes of the faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the most beautiful, recognized passages, possibly of the whole Bible. Baseball, football, basketball, all have their hall of fame. This is our hall of faith. He's saying, hey, don't you shrink back. You live by faith, which is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Like, like, in verse 2, he begins by saying, like Enoch, like Abel, like Abraham, like Moses, like Sarah. And he begins to live 16 people of faith. And he's saying, be like them and take action today in your faith. Faith is a hand up, but it's also a foot forward. I believe, and for that I take action. And he says, by faith, they did all these things. By faith, Abel offered a better uh, uh, a sacrifice. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham believed that it was counted as righteousness. I mean, chapter 11 is awesome. You know how we're going to change the world? By faith. Alex, by how? By faith. 
By faith, we're going to collect a bunch of items, take them over to the West Coast, and start rebuilding. We do that with our force, but we also do it by faith that God can use a church in Kendall to impact the world. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, we're going to do it. By faith, by faith, we could change a generation. By faith. And so he, like, it's absolute, in the middle of this, it's absolutely awesome, but in the middle of this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, he names all these people, then he says, all these people were still living by faith. When they died, they died in faith. They didn't give up. They did not receive the things promised. What, wait, hold up, what? They did not receive the things promised. Oh, but, but I thought God at least would give me some things because I need, I need my faith to be strong. Can your faith be strong even if God doesn't give you what you want now? And that's hard for us. Let's be honest. I've been there. Like we're praying for healing and healing doesn't happen. We're praying for provision and provision doesn't come. And they died and they didn't receive the promise. They only saw them and welcomed them from the distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. I love this. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. For if they were thinking of the country they had left, they would have... They would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Literally what he's saying is all these people he named, Abel, Moses, Abraham, Enoch, David, Gideon, they were looking forward, and they were moving forward. And although they may have received some promises, Abraham and Sarah died without seeing the multitude of sons they were going to have. But they believed it by faith. That's real faith that I can die and still believe that even when I'm gone, God will, will fulfill his word. That, Hebrews 11 is amazing. And they kept on moving by faith. And they said, well, we're not of this kingdom. We're not of this city. We're not of this country. We have a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly city, a heavenly country, which I'm going to. Otherwise, Abraham would have gone back to earth. Remember, he came out of Ur of the Chaldeans. If Abraham was looking for a country on this side, he would have been like, God, you haven't given me no kids. I mean, I tried to make one on my own with my servant, and that was a good idea by my wife Sarah, but it didn't work out. So I'm just going to go back to Ur, and I'm trying to build a kingdom here on earth. But he kept moving forward in spite of all the weaknesses he had because he had a better city, a better country, and a better kingdom. George Guthrie, he, he writes this. He says, he calls us with all our habits and hangups, warts and worries to action. We are called to step out of step with the world. Hop up on the stage of history and take our place in God's roll call of the faithful. Woo. Of course we're inadequate. But so have been all others who have evidenced the grace of God. It would not be grace otherwise. He's saying, you look at all these people and you're like, well, I wish I can live like all these. I, can, I wish. I wish I was like Enoch, Abraham. I wish I was like Gideon. I wish I was like, like this is awesome. But they were, they were awesome. And he's saying, no, they, they were mess ups. Noah got so drunk one night, the next morning he had the worst hangover in history. You've messed up, welcome to the club. We live by faith, not by our works. Oh, I might have messed up. I might have messed up. I might have had a bad week, a bad month, a bad year, but by the blood of Jesus, I'm forgiven. And if I open up my mouth and I repent and I turn, I move on to a better country by faith. And you and I, we need to move forward to something better. Hebrews 11, he finishes off with this. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Once once again, he reminds, by the way, they didn't receive what was promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that the only together with us, they would be made perfect. Basically, he said, they didn't even see the Messiah. You've seen the Messiah. You've heard from the Messiah. How does he begin Hebrews? Oh, in times of old, he spoke through various prophets and angels and all these kind of, but now he's speaking through the son. What Moses, Abraham, Sarah, Gideon, Barak, all these people, what they were looking forward to, we've now had. Because he was waiting to perfect us all together through Jesus. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful how chapter 11 ends and it begins chapter 12. Number one, we draw near. Number two, we take action. And to finalize chapter 12, he's going to say, we give worship. We give proper worship. And he's going to explain how we give worship. That's the third final point. And I'm about to finish because the clock has been possessed by a demon and it's running really fast. <laughs> but chapter 12, chapter 12, he, he gives us the hall of faith. And he says, all these people followed God by faith. They weren't perfect. They didn't receive promises. But they made it because they were looking at something better. Now you run. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... 
throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith. What are you looking at? He basically is painting a picture in the Greek. The word picture is literally a runner running in an arena and the stands are full of all those that have gone before us. And they live the life of faith and they're saying, if we did it, you can do it too. Go ahead and run. And it's basically saying we have people around us that we can look to to say, if Noah did it, if Abraham did it, if Sarah did it, if Rahab did it, then I can do it too. But he says, you need to throw off what's stopping you. Throw off weights and throw off sin. Today, some of us, we need to let go of some things. Oh, come on, I just sense this in my Today, some of us, we're going home different in Jesus' name. Come on, we're going home lighter in the name of Jesus. Oh, today, you need to drop whatever you need to drop. Today, some of us, come on, we need to let go of some habits. We need to let go of some bad addictions. Maybe we need to let go of some relationships that are not letting us run our run of, of faith. Let it go. He said, let go of what so easily entangles you. Let it go and keep running. Today, you are not in a race. He's going to go on and talk about um, how God loves to discipline us because he's a good father. And he basically says in the Greek, this is how God educates us through discipline. Basically, our world will shake. Why does it shake? God is educating us to look to him. And then he goes on in verse 15 through 16, Hebrews 12, verses 15 through 16. This is the fifth and final warning. See to it that no one's far short of the grace of God, that no one, no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance right as the oldest son. The fifth and final warning is don't despise Jesus and live for the here and now. Esau had a blessing in God, but he decided to despise it and live for the blessings of now. That, that will only serve temporarily. Don't be sexually immoral like Esau. Don't give up future blessings for temporary fleeting pleasures. And now he's going to go, and we'll finish with this. He's going to talk about two mountains at the end of chapter 12. You got to go home and read this. Go through our study guide. It's absolutely beautiful. He's going to talk about two mountains. And I wish I had more time, but but he's going to talk about Mount Sinai and Mount Zion at the end of chapter 12. Remember, he's talking about a better kingdom. And he's going to bring to their mind Exodus. In the book of Exodus, Moses, when he went to talk to God, the people of God were at the base, at the bottom of Mount Sinai. They were in the Sinai Desert. And in this mountain was over two million people. And they saw the mountain covered with clouds, lightning, and thunder. This was God at the mountain. And they knew that nobody can approach the mountain. God commanded them, if anybody touched the mountain, they would die. This is how holy and powerful our God is. Oh, come close in your sinful nature, you'll die. Moses, you're the only one to come up. And it says that God was speaking. And what God would speak, people were so terrified that they begged Moses for God to stop speaking. Woo. This is, po- this is how awesome our God is. He's powerful. Come to God in the wrong way. He'll zap you. Done. And people want to take God casually in our culture. Take God casually. You'll die in your sin. So Moses went up and in, in in that Mount Sinai, he received the word of God. Listen, he received the word of God. The Ten Commandments was in Mount Sinai. And he says, oh, I know that, that we used to belong to that kind of kingdom. That you couldn't go to God. And it says when God was speaking, everything shook. So they knew Moses was up there and the ground was trembling. There was fire, lightning, and they're like, oh my God, what in the world is going on? Literally, that's that's the picture that's going on. And he says, oh, but we've moved on from Mount Sinai now to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is now a spiritual place. In other words, he says, we used to go to physical places, but now we're going to spiritual places to hear from God. And Sinai was where you met God, but now you meet God in Jesus, he's saying. It's a different mountain. It's a mountain you can't approach. It's a mountain that you come with confidence. And it's a mountain that can't be shaken. Where the ground shook before and you couldn't touch it, now it doesn't shake and you can't touch it. His name is Jesus. You belong to a different kingdom. It's the kingdom of Zion. It literally represents Jerusalem, but not the city Jerusalem, the spiritual heavenly city that God is building. And we'll finish with this. Hebrews 12, verses 26 through 29. He says, at that time, speaking of Exodus, his voice shook the earth. 
But now he's promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. The words once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. He literally, what he says is this, we're not part of Exodus anymore. We're part of a new city, new country, new kingdom in Jesus. And once more, God is going to shake the earth. What he's quoting there is literally the book of Haggai. Because in Haggai, Hosea, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, there is always a prophetic tone that God is going to shake the earth. You read all throughout Testament and they'll say, one day God's going to shake the earth. And not only the earth, the heavens too. One day, if you don't know and you're here and you're building a kingdom on earth, I'm going to tell you, one day Jesus is coming and everything will be shaken. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And he says, not only, the not only the earth, the heavens too. Basically, one day, God is going to shake the cosmos. And everything will crumble, but one thing will remain, Mount Zion. And the kingdom that can't be shaken. It's Mount Zion. It's Jesus. It's the better kingdom. And he says, how do we respond to that? This is profound. You're running to synagogues? You're running to sacrifices and priests? We belong to Mount Zion. All that will crumble. In fact, he was speaking prophetically because 20, 30 years after this letter was written, Jerusalem fell. The temple fell. Sacrifices finished. The city of Jerusalem in AD 70 was destroyed just a few years after this letter. And they could no longer go to the temple because it was gone. And if your faith is in a physical temple, you're going to be lost. But we belong to Mount Zion, the better kingdom, Jesus. And although I can't see him, I live by faith. And so how do I respond? With faith, I respond with worship. With faith, I respond with my hands lifted and my head raised. I belong to an unshakable kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. Oh, he's the only one that will remain. And so today, with hands lifted, with voices raised, the kingdom of Jesus oh the earth and the heavens will pass away but your word will remain forever we belong to a different kingdom come on all over the place in the auditorium additional seating online wherever you are if you can and you're able to raise your hand and we respond in worship in all because our God is a consuming fire earth below us might shake. The world around us may crumble, but our faith is in Jesus. You may lose possessions, you may lose your house, you may lose your home, you may lose your kids, you may lose relationships, you may lose your significant other, we may lose our health, but I got faith and I live by faith. The God who promised is faithful and true. He's not a man to lie. He's not a man to go back on his word. And so lose what I may on this side. He's got me on the other side. And on the other side, that can't be shaken. That can't be shaken. Today, if you've lost hope, peace, and joy, because I get it, life has been painful and hard, I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill you right now with the hope that can only be found in Jesus. Today, I, I don't suppose to know what you've gone through, walked through. I, I don't know the pain that you've been in, but I know one thing, God knows and he loves you. And today he wants to fill you with faith. The assurance of things hopeful. The conviction of things not seen. 
pray that the Holy Spirit will bring healing right now. God, I pray that you heal. Heal our hearts, heal our minds. God, we pray that anxiety may go in the name of Jesus. I pray for every anxious spirit, spirit, every anxious person in this place. God, heal them right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that you'll heal us, God. You love us, you're for us, you're with us. Anxiety will not have dominion of our minds, of our souls, of our spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray for healing. Pray for every person that hasn't been able to sleep because of worry or stress or pain. In the name of Jesus, receive healing right now. Because of the curtain that was torn, because of his blood, because of his sacrifice, you have confidence to enter boldly and have faith. He's with you. He's with you. It's not optimism. It's not wishful thinking. It's faith. Everything's going to be all right in Jesus' name. I belong to an unshakable kingdom. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I'm going to move on, but just a second. He wants to give somebody confidence. You've been struggling in your faith. God, fill us with confidence today. You're a reliable, trustworthy source. Thank you, Jesus. You're so beautiful. You're so awesome. We may lose family, friends, followers. My kingdom's not social media. My kingdom is Jesus. I belong to a different kingdom. With every eye closed, every head bowed, we're leaving in just a moment. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Today, if you're in here and you don't know Jesus, I would love to give you one last invitation to start a relationship with this God who loves you. I'm going to ask Pastor Phil in a moment to come up here and finish our service. But with every eye closed, with every head bowed, if you're here today and you don't know God, maybe you feel far from God, you feel distant from God. Maybe there's some things in your life that you're saying, Alex, but you have no idea what I've been through, what I've done. Some of you are thinking about what you did last year, last month, maybe last night. I'm going to tell you, I may not know, but God knows and he loves you still. God is holy. He can't be with sin, but God is love, so he sent the answer for sin. Sin separates us from God. God is holy. He can't be with sin. So you and I, we've been separated from God. And sin has a heavy price. It's called death. But the Bible says that Jesus came and he grabbed my sin, your sins. Took them on his shoulders, went up on a cross at Calvary. He gave up his life for you and I. He took the wrath. He took the, the final price of sin. Jesus took it. He died. A gruesome death on that cross so that you and I would not have to die. We couldn't die for our sins. Jesus went down to a grave. He was dead for three days, but after three days, Jesus Christ, he resurrected. We believe with all our hearts by faith, Jesus is alive. And today he wants to give you a brand new beginning. Today he wants to forgive you of every sin you can imagine. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Today you can leave out of here forgiven. You can leave out of here with a relationship with the God who loves you, with every eye closed every head bowed in a moment of privacy in a moment of prayer nobody looking around if you're in here in additional seating we've got pastors back there as well if you're watching online i'm going to count to three if you say alex i need jesus today alex i need forgiveness today i want to belong to that city that country that kingdom that jesus is offering i'm going to count to three when i count to three i want you to raise your hand i'm not going to call you out nobody looking i just want to see who i'm praying for and then you can put your hand back down if you're saying i need jesus i need forgiveness Today, I, I want to begin a new life with God. At the count of three, you raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand as high as you can, as high as you can. Hands being raised up all over this place, all over this place. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I see you, I see you. In additional seating online, wherever you are, come on, God sees you. Come on, let's pray together. With every eye closed, every head bowed. I love it. It's the most important part of our service. So many of us, we did this, some of us five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But we said, God, help us putting our faith and our trust in you. I'm going to say a prayer. I want you to repeat this prayer with me, with all you got. In fact, the whole family together. Why don't we say this out loud? Say, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Jesus. I believe you're the Son of God, that you died for my sins, and on the third day, you resurrected. 
come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From today on, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, and I'm healed. In Jesus' name. Let's put our hands together for everybody that made that decision. Listen, if you raised your hand, we believe you made the greatest decision of your entire life. Your life will never be the same. Wherever you go, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit with you. You have an unshakable kingdom in your life now. And here's the thing, we also know that though it is the best decision, you probably have some questions. Like, what's my next step? What do I do now? What does it mean to be a Christian? And that's okay. That's why here at Calvary, we wanna be your resource. We wanna help you out, answer any questions you have, get you on that faith journey. And so our team set up an awesome gift, thank you JP, that you're gonna see outside of you raised your hand Maybe you need to raise your hand, but you know you, you made a conscious decision to give your life to Jesus. You get one of these gifts. It's in our Connect tent. We have a picture for you right there. You can't miss it on your way out. We got a team that wants to get you a gift, pray for you if you need prayer, but make sure you leave here knowing what your next step here at Calvary is. And so before, the Dolphins aren't even playing today, so don't even worry about it. Go outside, the food where you're gonna go eat at, it'll come. Get this gift we wanna get in your hands. I believe it's gonna change your life, amen? Come on, let's put our hands together one more time for them best decision you can make. Really believe it. Let's, uh, let's have this message on our heart this week. That wherever we go, the presence of God follows us. In your workplace, you still have an unshakable kingdom. At your home, you have an unshakable kingdom. In your difficulties, you have an unshakable kingdom all the days of your life. So have confidence wherever you go and believe that Jesus is for you. Why don't we leave here singing one more time, but can I pray for your week before we sing? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the word that you spoke. I thank you for the, just the encouragement that we received today, God. Help us, your people, to go out there with confidence, Lord Jesus, that wherever we are, God, we represent you well, Jesus, that we wouldn't be somebody else at the church and in other places, God, we would always be about your business, Lord. So I pray that you would bless your church, empower your church, that wherever we go, we would make a difference. So Lord, we love you, we thank you, in your name we pray, amen. God bless your church, let's worship one more.